We'll call the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Pat Kinney. Here. Blake Ellison. Here. Dick Pufal. Here. Brad Ray. Here. Ron Stendor. Here. Next, we'll go to number two, approval of the agenda. Uh, could I ask somebody to make a motion to move the aging unit uh, up immediately after public comments? I'll make a motion to move uh, 6E ahead. So um, right after public comments. Right after public comments. Brad will second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we'll go to number three, public comment. Is there anyone here for public comment? Is there anyone online or on the phone for public comment? Anyone in the room online or phone for public comment? Anyone online or in the room or phone for public comment? Hearing none, we'll move on to number three which is going to be the aging unit or the, what comes after three will be the aging unit. So last time you gave us a document, we've had a chance to read through that and then you sent um, some more information this time. So. Yeah, so in the end where, with the, the increase from last year to this year is just about 15%. So the increase is about $22,000-ish. So that keeps us ahead of what the meal costs are and that makes everything a lot easier on my life. Um, the federal government at this point, uh, the Senate is looking at a 20% increase and the House is looking at a, about 3% decrease all across the board for all the programs. And I did send you guys on the committee out an article that showed that a lot of places are running a three month at least uh, wait list. So, and we're not, we're not there because I've been tweaking on the program, but you know, if we, with the, with the increase, that'll keep us going well. Uh, it, there's more people constantly calling. We had six home delivered visits in the last week and a half. I've got four more people filled out congregate ones. So our count's just going to keep going up. You know, they say it's, was it 18,000 or not 18,000, 1.8 million people are turning 60 for each year. Or I don't know. I, at this point, I'm lost a number, but maybe it's 18,000 people a day is are turning 60. So for clarity, I'm looking at the document from last time you had 15,977.80. Is that still That's the number still you're not. looking for or for something different? No, in the document that I have, it's the one I emailed to you guys. Um, it's 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 approximately twenty two thousand. The fifteen percent increase takes it from one forty nine. Uh, one hundred forty nine thousand five hundred is what I got last year for for both programs, and this year with a fifteen percent increase, it's one. 171,925, which is a 15% increase. And that covers the price of the meals and that little bit extra that I asked for the transportation program. We're gonna need another bus driver. I, I can't keep up with the appointments. Bert can't keep up with their appointments either. We're constantly dropping people. And these are medical appointments usually we're missing. So can we separate out the discussion on the Meals on Wheels and the transportation? Um... So for the Meals on Wheels part is, so if I look at this, am, are we, I just wanna know if I should consider what you have in this document or for only looking at the more recent one that you sent. And the more recent one is the one where I did the split out so you can see if you take the okay. 15,000, there we go. Yeah. So thank you. Um, so 
out of that 149,500, that 59.9780, that's just the match for the transportation. So that's the amount I got last year in two payments, 74,750, one in January, one in okay. June. Yeah. Or actually July, because it comes out at the end of June. But so this year, I, I, I just added in the another 159.9780. That covers a whole person for a bus for me. We're not paying top dollar here. Um, which is sad <laughs> because I have some great people that are doing some great work and we're doing door-to-door -door service. That's what differentiates us from BART. They have routes. We do door-to-door. -door. So we pick up people at their homes with the lift. We take them to their shopping. When they come back, my bus drivers park that bus and help people to their doors with their, with their food or their grocery, you know, whatever they, they purchase. Um, it's a totally different level of service that we do for the aging and disabled with, because we're paratransit and we're trying to make our boundaries a little bit bigger because there's people just, it's been an arbitrary boundary of the city, the, the city limits and just outside of those boundaries, there's some of them that aren't even a 10th of a mile out that have been arbitrarily just told no and they're all aging too this is just going to increase and increase and bart's seeing the increase too they can't keep up with it either ron i have a question here you're looking for another driver correct yes. you only have one bus correct no we have two buses you have two we buses. have an older bus that we need to replace we'll get the new one i think we're at about seven months out right now is where it will be okay so yeah we have two we lease one older bus from bart it's one that doesn't work for them anymore it's it's generous to call it riding on a pogo stick <laughs> because it it has almost one hundred fifty thousand miles and it is well worn and the shocks bounce everybody around there's people with injuries that come complain about it all the time so I worked with BART and we're going to have a bus that'll be a little bit bigger because we're running into problems getting two wheelchairs on the bus because there's not enough room on our newer bus, which is a 2020. So this one will allow us a full-size scooter, which are increasing also, um, or two wheelchairs plus 12 people. So it keeps us just under the CDL limit. Okay. Yes, lots of when you when you pick up a resident at their home and you take them to wherever you're doing one person at a time, correct? No, we pick up as many people as we can while we can. But yeah, if there's only one person to pick up, that's what we do. Yeah, my, my concern is I used to drive for BART. Mm -hmm. And I also used to see the aging bus sitting for a while in front of the senior center. So, and the BART bus every hour would be coming to the senior center and uh it's kind of saying okay you need this now but yet i've seen where it's been sitting doing nothing well we do also have they have a lunch hour too so and uh this isn't just lunch hour i i work you know many shifts right up until the close what time does your bus driver stop well right now they stop at four but we have had increased need between four and six now because the appointments at MMC, the cancer center, et cetera, are going later and later. And people are, they, they can ride the BART bus, but if you're coming out of the cancer center, a lot of times the BART bus is not the most comfortable place to ride. A bus is a bus. Kinda. So, okay. Blake? <clears throat> so when we look at program income, there's con CONG donations and HD donations. Mm -hmm. Now, are those like, so as a fundraiser in various uh, situations now, I'm thinking about it. How do we see the trends on fundraising? Is that, are you seeing it growing? Are you seeing pressure on it? The only reason I ask is I've seen a lot of people that I deliver meals to that end up passing away 
that were benefiting from meals for a long time. And, you know, one of the things as a, hey, this is a really important program, you know, making sure those families realize, hey, this person that passed away was getting these meals. Oh, by the way, there's a significant trust and, you know, having us advertise that we would take these donations. You know, I think instead, I'm not saying we're not going to give you money or, but every year we can't keep going 20%. Oh, now we need a new van or it's got to grow the budget. I think we have to start looking at putting some, you know, like, Hey, next year, we don't want to ask for 20% additional increase next year. Right. I'd like to try to keep the cost down. And if fundraising is part of that, like, I don't know if we can do that maybe a little better or if you're thinking about it, I was just saying, cause I've been delivering a lot and I've, notice that there are a lot of people passing away that we're delivering to. And, you know, as, as we think about income and revenue, it can't always just be county's got to add more. That's all I'm saying. At, at some point we want to put that in check a little bit. Yeah. Um, there was quite a few years where the county didn't increase anything. And what they did is they kept cutting programming. And that's how we got to where we only have three staff members, which makes, and, and back, before me, nobody helped with the data entry or anything else. It was kind of the director was the spot that didn't that that did the paper processing. Uh, I'm doing more of that. Also, I've gone through the whole program and stopped using a whole bunch of styrofoam and consumables and stuff, and I've gotten our expenses down. That's why there's only been the increase for this. This the two years in a row, the fifteen percent increase. It's kind of like a makeup thing because we there hasn't been a lot of increase. And just from the few years that I gave you guys with that spreadsheet, you can see that they didn't the the costs have gone up, but that's because our our meal costs are going up. So we're up to almost uh, five fifth or five ten is what our median price is for the act the meal, the food costs because that that's all I'm asking at this point that you guys keep up with is is the actual food costs in in the meals program because that I really have no control over especially because at this point and I hope that Northland sticks around a little bit longer uh, I I don't I don't hold my breath but at this point that's where I have to go for that and the meal costs that are coming in like I said I'm I'm working with Butternut School District and I'm working with Glidden School District and their meal prices come in just a little bit underneath there so we'll have maybe a little more room next year I'm not coming back every time for this I, I just wanted to play catch up first and then to have a good plan going into where all of these these boomers and it's it's most of them don't most of the people that we're dealing with don't have cars anymore or they're too sick or we're taking them to their cancer treatments um we've been if we work with the hospital or the cancer center we build a we build a cancer center we we don't even build the 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 actual person anymore if they want to set up bus rides for their people so i've been going after that I've been doing advertising. I've been trying to get sponsors for our buses. So have somebody wrap the bus. So I, I've gone a whole deep end into looking for other ways to get revenue. The only thing is, is this meals program is state statute mandated. So that's why I only targeted the couple of pieces because I know what the county situation is. I'm trying to be very cognizant of that and I've streamlined what I can inside. It's just, I can't, I can't keep pushing back. You know, my, my top office person makes $16 an hour. My staff with the buses is making sub 15. My, my food, the actual people, packaging up the food and stuff, my site managers and such, under 11. This stuff has been, when I got there, they were all under like nine. And I, and I get it, but people have to have some kind of, towards a more living wage because their food costs are going up too. I, I can't keep 
pushing the cost down. We we ask for volunteers for everything. We don't. We went from having 300 or more volunteers before COVID to I'm lucky I can get the meals out every week. We don't have the volunteer power to do like they used to do a, uh, a taco, some kind of Mexican taco fundraiser. I don't have I don't have the volunteer power for it. And my staff is is pushed right to the limits. They are constantly doing something. So I do the best I can on that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I've been searching for outside things. I just wrote, I, I've got, and it's a flat brochure. My rest and rec program is through fa the faith in action piece because that seems to be the easier part to bring in the grants and have a little more freedom and keep the cost down for people, but also to write grants that match in with this and supplement what these pieces are. Because we last time we talked a little bit about how the grants work. So um, my staff gets paid out of, so in all those different breakdowns for those different categories, they'll get 20% of their wage comes out of C1, 15% comes out of C2. And then if they do a little bit of the other stuff, then it's a little breakdown out of each one. My transportation people mostly come out of transportation unless they help me out with the food band backup because there's a person that takes the food every time down to the other sites. Then they get a little breakdown out of the C1 and C2 for that too. So we spread it out as much as we can. We're just spread as thin as what we can get at this point. Dan, uh, your thoughts on the numbers? Microphone, please. Um, well, I, I, the actual county contribution last year was closer to 70,000 and the balance was um, state transportation aids. Um, so this is a, actually a 32% increase for us. Um, and or twenty two thousand one hundred eleven dollars, um, but if you look at it as the the state transportation aid is coming from the county, then it, it is it's close to twenty percent. So. Oh, the pass through grant. Yeah. Okay, so I, I guess if you want to count the DOT grant as part of that, that's well, that would be the that would be the seventy nine eighty nine. Yeah. So she so you're it's really you're asking for a 32% increase in the county contribution is what it amounts to. Not that I not that I disagree with you, but I mean, okay. I'm not sure where that is, but Okay, because the two checks that I took in were 74, 750 for the two things. The transportation grant got sent separate. Yeah, I, I understand that. Um, so I don't know exactly. Four, seven, I'm okay with the 74, 750 to use. Yeah. That's fine. Man. Okay. I'm, I'm just pointing out. Yeah, I don't have a check. Okay. It, That's all I'm pointing out. Yeah. Just so that not the not the twenty two thousand dollars is not a reasonable ask. Yeah. That's all. okay. <laughs> do we so, need a do we want to make a motion? Um is that may, may I ask him a question oh, but for clarity, if for clarity, what are you proposing you're okay with? And in particular, with the transportation aid, if we use that as part of the base for the increase, would that increase be something she could use at her discretion for Meals on Wheels if that's where her greater need is relative to transportation in the coming year? Well, like I said, I don't think 22000 is unreasonable considering the, the cost of inflation is kind of eaten up food costs for everyone. Um, and I, I do agree that the need for Meals on Wheels is growing in the county, um, that, that we have a lot of seniors that are on the edge. So I, I'm okay with $22,000. I 
especially if it goes to meals. But that's up to this committee. But because you're using the transportation as part of the base, which is with the motion then allow her to use it, say, for entirely for meals on wheels or as much of it as she wanted to, or would it be segregated in the same ratio as the transportation versus meals and wheels? Um, I, I don't have an opinion on the transportation portion of it. Um, I do know that food costs have gone up dramatically. I see the Cisco bills every week from the jail mm -hmm. and I'm constantly surprised at like, what? Right. Right. So um, I, I, I know food costs have gone up and I know you're doing what, 100 people a week? Um, in a month, we do 13, or, uh, there's somewhere between... 1300 and 1700 meals going out just for whom delivered our congregate is down a little bit right now because we've had to go to three days a week so it'll it's it's about a thousand a month yeah. for the congregate so i mean that's a lot of meals and at the number that they have i mean it's it's kind of hard to make that end meet so i i am i'm okay with Twenty-two thousand for meals, for sure. Or I mean, twenty-two thousand, and to use at the discretion for meals on wheels and/or transportation, so it's not divvied into two pots. She can right. use for either. Right, okay. right. But I mean, I, mm -hmm. I know the meals are the most most important part for her. Yeah, that's what your your constituents are going to be looking at the meals portion. And, and my thoughts on the buses, to the extent in the coming year you could look at. I understand the medical stuff. Sometimes when people are in for cancer treatment and stuff, they really need extended time and help and maybe family with them for that, which might be hard for BART to, you know, be that patient at the time, sometimes when people are in for treatment, but try to use the aging unit buses where it's most needed for people and where possible use the BART system for things other than that. So the need for transportation doesn't grow more than it otherwise needs. And therefore funding to the extent possible goes towards Meals on Wheels, which we've always heard is really important throughout the county. Yeah. So a recommendation for twenty two thousand to use. Yes, I, I would I would recommend that. Do we have a motion. Blake will make a motion to approve the increase for the Ashland Aging Unit of twenty two thousand. Ron Stender will second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Next, we're going to move to the presentation by M3. I have one quick question. Alex, how long is your presentation going to be? Um, it's mostly interactive, so it, it, um, it can be anywhere from five minutes to 20 minutes, depending on questions and, and um, you know, any conversation. And Mark, how long do you think yours is going to be? Um, I can give it five minutes, but just same as Alex, depends on how many questions there would be. It could be longer, um, but I'll just give the rundown of just of it instead of the history and main details. Just give you information what you guys need to know for now. Yeah, we could. The... PSC item 6A, um, if we have a motion to move that up next to let them go first, and then we'll come back to M3. So moved. Thank you, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Motion proposed. I'm sorry, who made okay. the motion? Brad did. And Ron was the second? Blake, Blake, second. Blake was the second, sorry. So we're going to allow um, the PSC to go next. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark. I'm with the PSC at the Wisconsin Broadband Office. Um, and back in 2021, Biden passed the infrastructure law, which gave $42 billion nationwide to expand broadband. Uh, Wisconsin was allocated $1 billion, along with a process on working on mapping to get every location in the state that's un and underserved with, with the service. Um, on an underserved is considered anything under 100 by 20. Uh, Ashland County right now, with the latest data we have, has 2,390 locations eligible for bead funding, and that's 25.6 percent of the of the county that uh, doesn't have adequate uh, broadband service. 
So uh, what's up right now is our FAQ sheet that we released on the role of county government with engagement and endorsement. There's a total of 12 points for that with counties and local municipalities, seven points from the county board in which the county will have to endorse a, a project proposal from an applicant, and then five points that the uh, applicant will need to show that they engaged the county and local municipalities, two points of letter support from local municipalities, and one point from a community anchor institution, which we refer to as public library, school district, public housing organizations, nonprofits. Again, that's a total of 12 points out of their 100 point application. Um, right now, we're still waiting for our final map because we sent our our challenge findings to NTIA in the process that we had to go through in order to get the final list of location. This is a federally funded program, not a state funded program. So that's why we have to go through all the processes through NTIA who is running the program and giving us the funding. Um, there, a lot of the requirements of BEAT is also from them as well. We did not have a lot of say in, into it, but we did have this say in engagement endorsement as we have found out through our grant application process that we ran throughout the state since 2014 that engaging with local municipalities and the county is very important in successful project making. Are there any questions so far? No? Okay. So with, with that, um, our letter of intent is open right now for applicants to, um, to apply. Um, the letter of intent will show that the applicant has the managerial, fiscal, financial, and technical capabilities to take on a BEAD project. We have seen recently from other federal programs that that internet providers have not been successful with taking on projects. So this is why this was implemented to avoid defaulting and messing up of funds. So in order for an applicant to even apply for, for the application, they have to do this LOI and then the, we have the PSC need to approve them to apply for, for funding. Um, the locations around the state will be built up in the, in, the, in the groups, what we call project units. And that's what the, and that's what the applicants will bid on. Those project units will not cross uh, county lines or or tribal land or tribal lands. Tribal lands will be their own project uh, units, but there could be multiple project units within within Ashland County. So the role of, again of the county government for you guys is to decide who you guys want to support for points for the applications. And if they haven't came yet, they will, and they may ask if the county has funds to contribute towards uh, the twenty five percent requirement. Uh, 25 percent requirement match i uh, just want to tell you that uh, the counties is not required to give any funds towards the match that's all on the applicant but as we've seen at the psc a lot of successful applicants and grant programs are done with match but not required they may ask even some isps will tell you up front that they're not required any match they just want your endorsement that is up to you guys and how you guys want to go about that but it's something to think about if you have any funds towards a match as like time approaches. Uh, the letter of intent process ends October 1st, and then we hope to open up the grant round starting ju uh, July 3rd. Again, that's preliminary based on NTI approval of our final list of eligible locations before we create the final map. Are there any questions on that? Oh, I guess I'll just, I'll just say, sorry. Mark, I have a question actually. Yep, go ahead. So what are we, what happens if there's no uh, businesses out there that want to place a bid in the county? Uh, no, that's a great, that's a great question. So the, there's the three grant rounds, uh, grant round is uh, fi fiber prioritized projects. And then round two is uh, focused on uh, first the fiber projects that had close sc grant scores. They'll in round two, they'll have a chance to come back and, and make their application better, lower cost services, technology. And then um, we'll decide from there which one of the choose of those. And then secondly, with round two, um, we'll look at other technologies such as license fixed wireless and coaxial cable and other tech for round two. And then round three, we'll be looking at the entire map, looking at the gaps that for areas that didn't receive bids still, because in round two, um, you can also enter new, applicants can also enter new bids or areas that didn't receive them. And so looking at the same thing around three, who didn't receive bids, where the gaps are, and then us at the PSC will be working with those project units or talking with ISPs to negotiate, um, offer incentives for taking on projects that 
have not been taken yet. And then round three, also looking at um, unreliable technologies such as low earth orbital satellites and unlicensed fixed wireless. As, again, as long as the, those technologies meet the adequate speeds of the of the of B, which is 100 by 20. So good question, thank you. Mark, this is Pat. I wanna ask you a question on the county um, match. On the one hand, you said the counties don't need to do that. On the other hand, it sounded like if they are part of the match, it increases the chances of getting funding. I'm just, for clarification, does it matter if it's a county that's participating in the match or if, just as long as the applicant gets the match somewhere? Yep, yep, the applicant will just need to provide the match, uh, however they go about it. So, um, for example, one one county already has money aside. They they looked at their locations of un and underserved locations, and they gave a dollar amount for each location. And without even the final numbers yet being determined by the map, that's just the the maximum amount of money they'll have to match if a ISP comes knocking. Um, there's another county that already did an endorsement with with an ISP even before we released our, our data a couple of months ago, but that county had a good working relationship with the ISP where they endorsed for the whole county for the projects. So again, you, you'll really have to work work amongst yourself to see if you guys want to contribute local match or not, or if you have the funds available, available for it. Um, I do want to say that by the time you get your endorsement done, you should have the match number in mind because we don't want the applicants to try and double dip with their with their um with their proposals saying that they're that they have this money this is what they're going to do and then a year down the road you know come to you guys the county like hey we need that money towards the match or additional we want to have everything set beforehand so there's no du double dipping because we want us want this billion dollars to reach every location in, in the entire state that doesn't have adequate broadband service um, for for the endorsement part, um, if you look in that FAQ, we're looking with our estimated timeline right now, we're looking at December 18th to have that completed. So it's only a few months away, and then that's during the ho um, holiday seasons are coming up. I know some counties don't even have December meetings, so that's why it's very important to address this. Um, Roll a county, you know, reach out to, you know, local municipalities, talk about, you know, let them know what's coming as well and their role role as well in the process. Because again, after the grant rounds will become permitting. There's gonna be a lot of permitting issues, a lot of a lot of waiting games. So it's good to coordinate and make sure you, the county and local municipalities has process to address permitting. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Blake? You had mentioned that ISPs would come kind of knocking maybe. Um, is that something that have we seen that? Do we have local ISPs that would come to us and say, hey, we want to be a part of this with you guys? Uh, I've spoken to a couple ISPs. Um, I, I guess I'm not at liberty to discuss the conversations in open session. Any other questions for Mark? If you need ISP contacts, I, I have ISP contacts. There's 13 uh, ISPs listed for the county. And then again, sometimes if they don't come, you know, a lot of counties being proactive at reaching out to, to to ISPs to see if they have any planned proposals or letting them know, hey, we have this money set aside towards match. Would you be interested with what we have for match to to apply for B for our, our area? But it starts with that uh, letter of intent, getting those ISPs and other eligible applicants to to get that done by October 1st. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move to M3. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so for today, I'm gonna to share my screen. What we're gonna be talking about, um, one of the asks uh, the last time we met was, can we uh, model a dual choice um, along with variable contribution amounts and variable uh, for premium contributions and variable amounts for the health savings account contribution if it were to be offered. And so I'm gonna bring that up right now. Looks like it's been disabled. I just made you co-host. Oh, okay. I feel like, there we go, got her. All right, is that uh, a good size for everyone? Can everyone see that okay?
everybody can read the numbers all right. Okay, perfect. Well, with this contribution um, modeler, what we've done is number one, um, place the most up-to-date single and family count as far as those participating in the health plan. Um, and we made it variable based on a few, few different things. So we can um, change how many people are participating in the traditional or the current plan that you guys offer uh, versus if you were to offer a high deductible health plan along with a health savings account, how many employees may participate in that product. Um, so with this uh, modeler, we can adjust that by the percentage. And, and so based on M3's experience in terms of employers offering uh, dual option plans, so a traditional plan like your current plan that you offer, and then a high deductible health plan option, um, we usually see when there's a premium contribution difference, like maybe it's 10%, you're currently paying 80% for um, the plan right now. And, and so if you were to say charge 90 or, or paid 90% of the premium for the employees on the second offering or the high deductible health plan offering, um, and then also in combination with that, um, put money into health savings accounts for those employees that choose the high deductible health plan, what kind of participation in that line can you expect? And, and from our experience, when you see that combined effort of a reduced premium, to incentivize enrollment. And then the contribution to a health savings account, uh, typically first year participation numbers come in uh, around 20%. So I'm just gonna plug that number in right up here. And you can see um, it starts populating out the numbers. The first thing we see is 20% of the insured population then becomes around nine single plans and about 16 family plans. Um, and by the way, these premium numbers are based on your current total premium in uh, column D here. And these secondary numbers for the high deductible health plan are based on the plan modeling that M3's underwriters have um, performed based, you know, on your claim spend and how increasing the deductible and having a high deductible health plan would change that overall claim spend. Um, so with those numbers, we can also assume a contribution amount. So um, we've got this at a thousand or two thousand, but again, this is interactive um, to any amount that you'd like to plug in there. But ultimately then based on where your premium is set now, so all things plugged into here, um, we can see what that looks like, including the HSA contribution um, per month in this column, and then total per year, and then total premium. Now this is overall, so this is before we remove what the employees would be contributing, would be in the neighborhood of 3.4 million. Um, and then based on the contribution amounts, 80% for the traditional plan or your current plan that you have, and then 90% contribution amounts um, for the high deductible health plan, the actual expense to the county, again, after the employee's portion is removed and the health savings account contributions are built in is 2.7. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Um, now, from our experience from, from implementing a dual choice uh, option like this in the past, um, the first year, usually 15 to 20% to is a, a pretty solid number if that premium strategy is in place and also there's a health savings account um, contribution being made. Um, obviously, you can see plus or minus there um based on a few things how long has the move been planned and how much time have we had to educate employees on the benefits uh and cost analysis of both options 
Um, and then how much do the employees value the different philosophies of the plan designs? Um, you know, do employees fully understand the high deductible health plan versus how it relates to the current plan? Um, and then obviously the other consideration is uh, specific demographics of, of your plan uh, or, or your participants can, can impact that. Um, so we just received uh, at 1245 the renewal for BPA, the current plan design. However, we haven't had any time. 1245 didn't leave me much time to analyze that um, or build this into today's presentation. Um, we have received competitive bids for your for your health plan moving forward, which includes um, you know looking at the traditional plan that you're offering currently and HDHPs. Um, I anticipate having a full scope of the marketplace and the analysis uh, within two weeks. And so I know the next the next finance committee meeting is a month from today. My understanding is that accurate? Uh, no, we're going to have to have one earlier. Um, probably the first week in October. Okay. Um, so from a timeline perspective for a full um, analysis, and also I, I know you guys are, are looking into the state ETF uh, route. Um, so for a full analysis from a timeline perspective, are you guys comfortable with that, that meeting in October and having a conversation, or is there something we can do in the meantime? I think we're going to be okay with October. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would think October 3rd, I believe, is the Thursday. Okay. So, yeah, so it would be October 3rd at like 2 o'clock. Mm -hmm. But I can email that when it's confirmed. Um, now, just to give you an idea of where we're at in the, the marketplace assessment, um, there's been some surprises. Um, so I'm just going to reset some of these numbers here. Uh, number one, there are a few companies that uh, feel you're a good risk and have delivered numbers already that are very, very competitive. In fact, they're presenting cost savings. Um, obviously, there are some issues with um, you know deciding on plan design and and those HSA contribution amounts um, being in there. But um, some of the savings that we're seeing, just for example, um, we have a company that's come in all in uh, at three point one million for the year. So considerable savings to what you're spending now at 3.5. And in addition to that, obviously, um, looking at where the renewal will fall with your current carrier, um, this, this, the numbers we're comparing this bid for 2025 to is, is current. Um, so once we get the renewal numbers plugged in here, I anticipate to see even more savings based off of just general trend in the marketplace of medical claims. And I know last time we had a conversation, uh, there was a lot of interest in what that dual choice option would look like as far as being able to uh, have a health savings account um, qualified plan alongside of the traditional plan that you currently offer. Um, does anybody have any uh, uh, questions at all surrounding how that would be done. So I feel like at the finance committee, we have really wanted to talk about the HSA. Mm -hmm. And then when we bring it to the staff of the county, it kind of falls flat. And then I feel like we're pushing down this idea again to them. And so you talked about education as being the key. Is there a way for us as we come in? Because if we don't educate people, they're not going to do this. And and I feel like nobody's gotten to them yet based on some of the feedback we've gotten from individuals at the county that have told me how they feel. So again, I think 
education now is if we're going to even bring HSAs to the employees for this coming year, we're going to have to start talking educational wise. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. And it, it's, I, I prefer the, the best in our experience uh, when we roll out a dual choice um, plan, number one, it's, it's a nice way to do it because the employees aren't forced into um, selecting one plan or the other, or I'm sorry, the employees aren't, forced into selecting just the HSA option. Um, so that number one lowers the anxiety and and generally the, um, you know, the unknown questions that they may have. And so if you get, okay, first year on, on a group of 124 total employees enrolled, you get 10, 15, 20 of those employees that participate in the plan. That actually is the best that, you know, like there's a lot of sales, people that'll, in my industry, that'll sit here and tell you, oh yeah, we've got, Gobs of resources. We can train your employees to view HSAs in a very positive light and move forward. But and we do. We have tremendous resources from an educational perspective. Um, and and I imagine the local banks and in, in Ashland would probably even love to help out with a lot of that communication and, and education, uh, which we've deployed in the past. Uh, but the best experience, the best way to train employees is once you see three or four of your coworkers that have made that decision to go with the health savings account option have a good experience. Um, and so the first year, like I said, if, if you if you anticipate 10% enrolling on the high deductible health plan, um, then the, the second year we usually see, um, you know, get closer to the 20, 25%. And, and as time goes on, you know, more and more people are able to, to witness how that is actually operating for those folks. Now, the danger of that is, now that I've said that, right, the danger is if, if you have two or three people that choose the high deductible health plan and then, you know, have a terrible experience for whatever reason, maybe it's a worst case scenario type claim or who knows, be anything, um, then you could have the opposite impact. So it's got to be a combination of as we go lead up to open enrollment and January 1, right, those touch points of Here's the basics of high deductible health plans in combinations with health savings accounts. And then um, pairing with uh, webinars that we can, we can push out, pairing with in-person meetings, pairing with education materials that we can bring to the county and, and can, can be handed out to employees, along with hey, who are the, the local leaders in, in banking um, that have successfully helped employers in this situation too. In terms of, you know, who can set up the health savings account? How how does it operate? What can you do with it? Answering all those those questions and, and being a resource there, that's a, a really good start. But ultimately, it is having those success stories from from your coworkers that that is a huge influence on um, actual participation in that high level health plan. This is Pat. I got two questions. One, you said there's a company that thinks we're a good risk and they were at 3.1 million. Is this like car insurance sometimes where they offer you a great introductory rate and then they jack it up after that? Does that happen with health insurance like some other insurance we're familiar with? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And it is a complete, it's, it's a very real possibility. Um, and that's, you know, why M3 is helping out with you guys. It's to evaluate um, those risks. And, and to understand if it's a, a viable offer or if it's just the company looking to do that. Now, um, typically the partners that we work with at M3 don't play those games. Um, very rarely have I seen those games happen uh, with, with the carriers that we work with. Um, but that's part of the vetting process too. Um, that's with our internal under underwriting team at M3. That's why they exist. Um, or one of the reasons they exist is to make sure that any offer we bring forward to you guys from any carrier, any stop loss provider, whoever it might be, it's a legitimate offer and it's based in reality so that we don't have that second year surprise. Um, and there's multiple ways of, of, making sure we don't have a second year surprise regardless of the carrier. Um, and we're definitely pursuing those actively. And like I said, in two weeks, we'll have the full analysis prepared and, and ready to have that conversation. 
So my second question is, if we offer the HSA option, because we don't know how many people will pick each option, but in other organizations, more tend to move to the HSA over time. Does this translate into from the county's perspective as far as budgeting, because it's less predictable than if we offered one option, we might have a more variance in terms of whether we underfund or overfund our health care this year? Is that in a sense a risk or something we need to anticipate on the county? No, that's a that's a great question. And as far as um, you know, let, let me let me re restate your question just to make sure I'm I'm getting at the right answer. So question is if we have Plan A, which is a two thousand dollar deductible on a single. We have Plan B, which is a five thousand dollar deductible on a single. Does that reduce our ability to, you know, anticipate where we're going to wind up? Is that accurate? Right, because now there's just one more variable in terms of how the year goes, because there's different plans that we don't know how many people will choose each, and so the outcomes for the county in terms of the budgeting might have more variance than otherwise and we just need to you know expect that as a possibility in the budget process not that we can't manage it but we just need to not be surprised by it yeah i, I don't think it'll play much into it as far as um from a self-funded perspective right you're more concerned with what the spec deductible is set up sorry now you guys have that sixty five thousand yeah, dollars spec deductible yeah it's, it's not gonna uh, it's just something we'll err on the side of caution and um right so okay anything else on this any other questions comments so we're good to hear that i think so alex um yep. put october 3rd on your calendar noted all right thank you all right Then next we will go to the approval of the minutes. Brad will make a motion to approve. Ron Stender will second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Then we'll go to 6B, financial updates with Steve and Mike. Hey, good afternoon. Um, oh, thanks, Dan, for putting that up. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right. After all the stimulating conversation about healthcare, now we're moving into more numbers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so here's your report for uh, the period ending August 31st of this year. Um, it's been updated um, to reflect all that activity. Uh, just kind of, I'll, I'll give you my highlights, and then certainly if there are questions, we can we can try to answer those two for you. Um, on the revenue side, I would point out if you compare 2024 actual um, year to date for general fund and 2023 actual year to date for general fund, you'll see this year it's about 5.031 uh, million of general fund revenue. Last year, 3,805. Um, a big reason for that is you receive the aid from the state with regard to the Sanborn tax issue, um, which was unbudgeted and will not actually be revenue at the end of the year. Uh, Mike is working with Jen and property listing to remove those delinquent taxes from your records, which are sitting in a receivable account. So in essence, that aid will go to somewhat pay off those taxes that are no longer valid to be collected. Um, so it won't actually be revenue. Um, and you also received an opioid settlement of, I believe, around 150000 payment, too, which was not budgeted. So good things, but yet, you know, that's the reason for the, the difference in the, the revenue. Um, some things in your general fund that uh, positive and negative. Um, your forestry stumpage is at about 50% of what you budgeted. You had a half a million in there for budget. I think you're at about 235 through the end of August. Um, I know that's a challenge with um, the whole industry there with forestry products. Um, on the good side of things, um, your interest income on investments is up 
about 52,000 at this point um, compared to last year. Sales tax is up slightly about 20,000. So I think overall you're sitting in a good position with regards to your general fund revenues. Um, let me see, just going down the page, the County Road and Bridges Fund and the Highway Internal Service Fund. Um, for the Road and Bridges Fund, the expense side is as of June 30th. Uh, the County Highway Department hasn't completed the billings to the Special Revenue Fund for the services in July and August. Um, earlier this year, that was way behind because uh, the county switched to a, a new time reporting system that was um, causing issues with getting data to flow through and whatnot. So there was a backlog that should be fixed now. So we discussed earlier today that the goal should be set that um, highway eventually gets to where by the 15th of the following month, the prior month should be built out and completed so that your financials reflect the, the current situation. Um, so that'll get work done. Um, just trying to see what other notes I had written down here. Um, in your expense side, I think things are tracking pretty close to what we had anticipated, except as I said, with the County Road and Bridges Fund. Um, your ARPA account there, a lot of that has to do with your courthouse uh, repairs and things like that. Um, I think there's also some expenses in there that we found out probably should be in your general fund with regard to the dispatch, um, or I think that was in capital. Sorry about that. So um, everything though, I think is right in line. I don't know, Mike, did you have anything you wanted to add or I missed? Uh, no, no, I, I agree with that highway thing that, that uh, um, is a little behind and, and we hope to get that cleared up more up more back on a cycle as yeah. soon as possible so so i think that's what we have from the standpoint of what we've observed um if anybody has any questions though we'd be happy to to get you an answer blake last time we talked a little bit about the um delinquent payments for sheriff related to the bad river did we write that off do we decide or are we still? No, uh, I know Steve and I have a conversation tomorrow morning with Chris McGissich and their accountant. Yeah, uh, I mean, they wanna, they that's not even in this problem. year's budget then, right? That's well, they, they want to solve this before the next county tribe meeting. So, so, Blake, to answer your question, there were revenues and expenses included in the budget, but there are no actual revenues or expenditures charged to that account. Um, it was in the budget, I think, due to the fact that if something could be worked out, the county could, you know, plug and play and hit the ground running. But to date, it hasn't been resolved yet. Um, so there still is an outstanding balance due from the tribe for those services back from 22 and 20. 22 and 23, I think, Dan, 21 and 22, something like that. 22, 23, and up to May or June of 20, uh, up to May or June of 23. Yeah. Any other questions for Mike or Steve? Sounds like we're good then. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And then we're ready to go to the capital budgets. Mike put together a, everything on one sheet. Um, so do you want to look at the capital budgets as a whole be, for motions, or do you want to take them one at a time? I think we could. It's up to you. Um, however, however the committee wants to do it. They're all essentially on this one sheet here. Um, let's try to make this bigger so we can see it better. Let's see if we can do it as a whole, and if we need to split it up, we will. Okay. Well, there is one. There is one late request in for the sheriff's department. Um, that's not on here. That I'll. It, but maybe if you want to do that separately, or do you want to do that as part of this? Well, would, they had an item submitted. They're just adding to it. They're they're adding to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do I don't because know. Because they're on the agenda, we could add it to it, which I think is okay. 
Okay. Well, okay. So what the sheriff's department, the sheriff department would like to lease another vehicle. Uh, this would just be, this would be for emergency management use. Um, so it would not be outfitted with lights and radios and all that other stuff. So it would just be a plain vehicle. Uh, the lease rates could be about six or 7,000 a year. I just have one question. Yeah. As I drive around and I see various sheriff vehicles, fuel efficiency is not what we've thought about at all ever. Um, and so we need V8 engines. Well, I get that, but do we need the least fuel efficient vehicles possible now? I mean, I think we need to start thinking about that and directing the people buying the vehicles to start looking at fuel efficiency a little bit more importantly. That's a cost save to the county. Yeah. Well, and I think that if you approve the emergency management vehicle, um, that could be as fuel efficient as possible. I mean, she's not rushing off to an accident or, yeah. Do you have a specific number for this vehicle? Uh, no, I don't, not offhand. They wanted to see if we, you'd even be open to it. Okay, this isn't the final vote on the budget. So for today, we could add it, but we're gonna have another meeting October 3rd and we can review any or all of this again if we want to. Yeah, um, I mean, if you want to pass all of this except for the vehicle, you can. Or if you want to wait till October 3rd, you can. Well, when we get a motion, if someone wants to include it, we can. So going through the capital budgets, um, the first one is a sheriff request. Any questions or comments there? Uh, the forester you missed, that was the first. I'm sorry, they missed uh, Registered deeds in Forrester. Oh, uh, oh, okay, sorry. I'm looking at the whole consolidated one here to make it look. Um, it's on the website. Well, let's look at the consolidated one that Dan has since that's what's projected. Yeah, and it's under emergency. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. It's called uh, CIP 2529. So it's the last item um, under 6B. Yeah. So the last item under 6B. Register of Deeds, any questions or comments? Forestry, we had talked about this once previously. You already approved the radios. Yeah, we approved it. We're okay there. Sheriff, we have the list of items there, and then you would add the vehicle for six to seven, and we'd have a specific number at the next meeting? Yes. Okay. Any questions or comments on the sheriff? Moving next to the IT. Dan, you want to walk us through in particular that... Um, request that would be the nice to have oh well um first of all i think i think you should approve all of it um one the computers and server replacement i mean we replace computers every year um they get they get placed replaced in a four or five year cycle um we're on that four or five year cycle for a server now too um uh there's going to be upgrades to our phone system um it's old and doesn't work well. Um, all right, we need a new camera system here in the courthouse. Uh, the one we currently have, the hard drive failed on it, um, and it's not. It will not no longer be repairable after this. So um, we need a new, and especially given all the possible threats out there, we need a new camera system. Um, we do we do uh, use Heartland business systems for some things, um, and that's that's a staffing issue on our side. Um, the network monitoring software is something that we need. I mean, you have to they have to be able to know what the heck's going on. And the endpoint management is, uh, I believe that's, I'm, I'm not sure what that is. In the sheriff's department, they. Uh, they need a new video recorder there too. Um, and they have some IT equipment they got to replace. And then replacing the PC computers in the jail. 
So on the IT, the last two items, the network monitoring software and the endpoint management in the packet yes. um, under IT, those were on the wish list. And Dan and I talked about those a day or two ago. And his recommendation was that we include those. And I had asked him if adding a software to what IT has, if that involves some training and learning new things and workload and you thought. It, it involved a little bit of training, but in the end, it will help help them with our workload. And the endpoint management, I guess I'd like to have you ask her more specifically uh, what that is. I know where I work, they brought that in a few years before I retired. And the, what I recall of it, it seemed like an awful lot of work. And the few years that I experienced it, to me personally, I didn't think it had gotten us to the point where it was making life easier. It just seemed like more work and more to keep up and duplication. So I'd like to ask you to ask her to make sure, is that something you really want? And so there's clarity on this is actually right. going to make life easier and better for the county. Well, here here it is, the website, um, or what endpoint management is. Basically, it lets them to automatically update every computer and get onto computers remotely. So that means like Rachel or T Taylor would not have to come here to do something or have to go to the highway to do something. Okay, so this is specific to the IT work. Yeah. The one I experienced was to something different. And for me, for what I did, it did not make my life any easier. Yeah. And the people that had to use it the most um, felt similarly. So if it makes her life easier, if you just double check to make sure. Yeah. Yeah, it does. But yeah, it is it's to make IT's life easier. Okay, so that's on the wish list. That yeah, what you just described would, given how we're connected. Yeah. Um, anything else on IT then? I, I just one question with the phone switch over. Yeah. I think nationwide, it's go, we're going away from landlines, totally. Yeah. Is it time to start thinking about voice over internet as phone replacement? I, I, I believe actually, I believe we already have the VoIP. Okay. Yeah. It's just the system is is old, right? I just don't know if we need to spend money into a, a landline system where we should. When it no, seems like it seems like AT and T is not even investing in landline anymore. No, nobody's investing in copper. Yeah. So, so no, we already have the waste of our internet. Okay. Anything else in IT? Then going to the sheriff's department. Uh, we you were there. We already covered the sheriffs. Okay, so you were then that was sheriff's IT. It was sheriff's IT. Yeah, and they... I, I had asked Dan a couple of days ago about that video recorder equipment. If potentially recording to the cloud makes sense at this point in time, I don't have an answer to that yet. Yeah, but either way, there'd be an expense there, so we would budget. And if using a cloud server would make more sense, then you don't have to upgrade equipment in the backup. And some of that. So I know some places do that, but I don't know if sheriffs are. Yeah, that makes they sense. are. Sheriffs are. They're uploading. And, you know, we're going to have to do some of the cloud storage. Um, body cameras. That data has to be kept for X number of years. Dash cameras. Stuff has to be kept for X number of years. Anything that has to do with a felony case. Um, we have records upstairs that are 75, that court case has to be kept 75 years. Um, so anytime there's a possible, we have to keep all that data uh, and everybody's doing it online, whether it's Amazon Web Services or Microsoft or whatever, you store it online because physical server capacity just is not capable of doing it. Hey, just one question on the, so... We're buying in the general seventy one thousand worth of computer and server replacements. Yeah. And then in the jail PC replacements, we're spending sixty five hundred. Does the general not buy for everyone? And then, um, do we? There, there's could, two different IT people, so they have two different requests. Okay, because yeah. I'm just curious when you think about IT, how many of the groups or the different areas within the county are getting at the general. Everybody except for sheriffs is under general. Okay. And sheriff is by itself because sheriff has their own dedicated IT person. Okay. Then going to highway? Um, I think we've gone over this quite a bit and I would recommend approving it, this. 
your vehicles and the roads. I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, you want me to put the highway specific one up? If I can find. Uh, CIP requests. I think second draft is what Matt. So, Matt, does this look right for your original one? Yeah. Use the microphone, please. Yes, that's that is the correct. So I did take the four hundred thousand dollars out in twenty six for building construction, land improvements. Um, given the fact that we're doing a space need study, we need to wait to see what happens with that. Let me maybe these just. Um... Instead of flipping through different documents here, when you get reimbursed from the state or townships, you call that revenue. Mm -hmm. And then you had a column next to that that you called um, you had a column next to that um, gains or losses. How did you determine the gains or losses? Is that in that um, I think that's but, in your regular budget, not the CIP. Yeah, in the regular budget. Um, trying to figure out where. I think we're we're on CIP on the agenda though, Pat. Because I'm what I'm wondering is, you know, the revenue comes in, and, and I hear phrases like, "Oh, you know, we get reimbursed from the state or the townships, and that pays for equipment, which is capital stuff." But then when you run the snow plows, you've obviously have some labor, there's some insurance, there's fuel, there's maintenance and all this other stuff. And the accountants are really good at putting that full list together of everything to consider, you know, when you mm -hmm. acquire equipment and operate it. So that's where I'm curious how we came up with the gains or losses as we do that. And then where does that money go? when money comes from the state or the townships, where does that money from an accounting perspective end up going, which leads to the question of, does the finance committee or county board actually know what where that money goes, which in part means, does it get you know, approved for uses that it gets used for? I'm just trying to, to follow the money, so to speak, and understand that. And then a somewhat related question is, if we're getting reimbursed from the state and townships, when we pass these budgets, are we passing a budget that says here are the wages and benefits for all of the employees? We pencil in a number for that, but then some of it gets reimbursed from state and townships. And if that's true, now we've got this pot of money coming in for reimbursement, which is kind of big. And then where does that money go? So that's I'm trying to understand how that works. That is, is this what you're looking for? Yeah. So, so our revenues come in, like you say, so labor is always separate. We charge for time, whatever the time is that's charged at the, the actual hourly rate. It's somewhere's a little above $40. So let's start with labor in your budget request. Are you penciling in a number for labor that assumes everyone is working for the county full time during the year? Or are you penciling no. in a number that estimates what the county share would be based on past history. Yeah. So if you look at our budget, it doesn't actually have a, a labor line. It has a, a it has a revenue line of each of these things from state revenues, township revenues, county highway revenues. Then it also has the expenses that match them lines, you know, state state expenses, county expenses, uh, township, you know, other other work we do. So that that money comes in as a revenue, but it, then it goes out as an expense for labor, um, equipment expenses, <laughs> material expenses. When we look at this budget, there's a list of employees and we have a wage study. So you got mm -hmm. a wage scale and all this good stuff. So it seems we're, we're penciling in number in the county budget that we're approving, correct? Uh, well, yeah, we, so to put together spreadsheets that had everybody's wages and number of hours they work a week. And with, for, per department, that's how we entered it in. And that's as if they're working for the county full time. That's a starting point. Right. So, yeah. And so then 
when we pass a budget and finance and the county board passes it, it's in anticipation of doing some work for the state and the towns. Yes. So so our our general levy ask is approximately five hundred thousand. It's five hundred and something, whatever. I don't have that. So when that money comes in from the state and the towns, yeah. Where's that money going? Back to out to all the expenses, which is our labor, equipment, materials. It, this is Gary. Two, one of the things is every year the towns ask the county to do work for them or have a free agreement. Sure. So every year you have to kind of estimate yeah. what maybe next year will happen. I'll give you a good example. Town of Agenda had a, a, a shouldering project. They can handle it with their little dump trucks. So at one point they had the county come in with the big semi dumps and they did it. So the county charged the town mm -hmm. for that revenue. You assume that every year you're going to get so much business. Now you could be wrong. Mm -hmm. The towns yeah. could have less work or more work, mm -hmm. but that's still part of the county's budget. They're they're anticipating getting X amount of dollars, and they either get it yeah. or they don't. And then when that money comes in, it's just it's money earned, but it's money spent. Yes, we don't anticipate to pay the wage from the county dollar. We we anticipate the wages through all of the revenue sources. You know, they all they all go to that to the pay the wages. Yeah. The equipment expense um you know like i said we have say approximately five hundred thousand dollars of of general levy dollars we get almost six hundred thousand nowadays for gas tax aids um we get a little over a million for our our state um rma contract that's to do the state maintenance so all of them dollars together pays for the labor equipment and materials used on our the work with that we do that's so with the with the revenues and you have these gains or losses so the gains loss column i think that's is that the what's um, the, on the equipment sheet yeah so, so yeah so that's yeah. that's that, that say, say matt or dan do you want me to jump in a little bit with this, I mean, or? is gains or losses really the right phrase here? Well, me, yeah, Mike, maybe you can help. Yeah, well, I I can certainly help with the gain and loss piece of this, and and maybe overall too. Okay, the the well, the first of all, the depart the state DOT controls a lot of the accounting that's that's used here in the county highway because they pay a big portion of it, but. Um, the gains, there's a book value on every piece of equipment. You know, you buy a truck for a hundred thousand, you know, say you say you sell it after eight years, it's eighty thousand depreciated. So there's a twenty thousand dollar book value. And say you sell it for fifty, that's a thirty thousand dollar gain. It's a book gain on a sell, but it's cash from sales. So that's how the gain and loss. It's just like any other kind of disposal of an asset that has a book value. If you get more, it's a gain. If if you if if it's junk or worthless uh, before its useful life, it's a loss. So that that's and that that goes into all the revenues, including gains, go into the machinery fund, which is a. a specific set of accounts um, on the highway cost, what they call it a cost pool. And then your, your revenues go in there that you get from your hourly charges um, also go in there that you're charging the state, the county and locals. And that money is used then to replace equipment. It's, it's not included in the levy. It's, it's in the, it's in the KIP thing but it's funded with annual uh, it's not funded with borrowed money it's funded with operational revenues well tell me how depreciation figures into what we're looking at well it's used to calculate the book value which then compares that to the sale proceeds or lack of proceeds to get you a gain and a loss that's how book value comes in each each piece of equipment has a book value at your end, and is depreciated, you know, over its useful life. 
So these vehicles that we still have because they're not haven't been sold yet, these numbers. They they have a book just, value on the book, you know. They, it's, they they include they include depreciation though in that gain and loss. Yeah, right. But I mean, the book value is the purchase price minus depreciation. That's the book value at any point in time. All right, and these trucks from like two thousand and two and earlier, they don't have any depreciation left on them because they're so old. A truck is depreciated over ten years, I believe. Yeah, and I believe there's a 50, is it a 15% salvage value, Matt? Is that right? Yes, that sounds right. Yeah, so what the DOT says, you buy an expensive truck, you know, and these are obviously expensive pieces of equipment. As long as it still runs, it's still going to be worth 15% of what you paid for it, you know, and that's an average. Um, so that's once the, once the, the piece of equipment is, past its useful life and you're still using it, it'll keep that 15% book value. And then when you get rid of it, trade it in, junk it, whatever, then you write that off. Or obviously if you sell it for more than that, you get a gain. And I think if I could comment, I think on the screen, Mike and Matt, when, when you have listed 2023 gain slash loss, is that the difference between the revenue produced by the vehicle versus its expenses, which includes depreciation. So Correct. truck yes. 52 made 38,000 covering all its fuel, all its repairs, all its depreciation over its revenues. Correct. Right. So from an accounting perspective, are we really tracking all of the expenses related to that? Yes, yeah. we are. Do we know we're doing yes. that? Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, all yeah, it, fuel expense, shop expense, that's all tracked to each piece of equipment. Yeah. It, it's very detailed. The mechanics, wages, the fuel, the parts, batteries, insurance, and shop overhead all goes in there. Dan does yeah. have a copy of that big spreadsheet you showed me before the meeting. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. And uh, Pat has a copy of it. Multiple too. page spreadsheet of, um, of every piece of equipment we have. So even things like depreciating the building are prorated onto something like this? Yeah, Mike, can you... Buildings you are, any, are not on you this have spreadsheet. Any handy, but, handy? but we use the building to do maintenance. So there's a... There's Shop a overhead. The building to do maintenance. So we're really mm -hmm. capturing everything that we invest in. Yes. Mike, do you have that highway department report handy? Um, not... I don't know if I mean put it up quickly on screen. No, yeah. that's, no, that's that's enough to answer my question. Is is you know sometimes we hear that oh we're making all this money. I want to make sure that we're actually really covering all the overhead mm -hmm. because sometimes people start a business or they you know say construction business and then they all of a sudden realize my God there's a lot more expense to this than I realized. No wonder I'm losing money. Mm -hmm. So we're actually capturing all of that in detail. And so when we uh -huh. see these numbers, we actually know that. We yeah. Actually yeah, I mean, that, that okay. that's right. The DOT, I mean, it, you start with building and grounds and you capture all costs there and they get allocated to shop and administration. And then the shop gets allocated to each individual piece of equipment. Okay, no, I'm, I'm fine with this. Yeah, that's yeah. because I don't know, when some of us started on this four years ago, um, you know, not everything was where it is today. Let's put it that way. So if, if it's all tracked, I'm good with that. So let's move on from highway unless someone else has a question. Dan, do you want to go back to the sheet that you, yeah. just, the one that Mike and Steve had? Yeah. yeah. So we're at the end there actually, highway. Okay. Um, so not, and below it is how, everything would be paid for. And if I could add, Dan, like Mike had indicated, if you look at the highway vehicle equipment replacement, it's 570,000. If you look down under the funding source, it says operations through annual revenue. So they're funding it from money they've generated within their fund. It's not being asked for on tax levy or to be borrowed. And, and just so I'm clear, 
similar to some of the other things I'm part of, there's like a capital fund that they've set this money into that grows, right? So they can take that 570 out that they need. Yeah. And how much is in that capital fund? Uh, it's not much more than 570. <laughs> Just curious. Yeah. So, so our capital fund is about 1.1 million today. Yeah, maybe if I can just, I, I don't want to get into too deep here, but I mean, see, the highway is an enterprise fund. It's a business type operation. And I know you were talking before about matching up revenues, the expenses, but, you know, basically when a, when a highway employee goes out in a truck, he's getting billed somewhere, state, local, or county, or if he's doing something for the shop that goes in the operation of shop. So it's all, it's a very somewhat uh, sophisticated cost accounting system. So um, that it, the money available, what, what Matt was talking to 1.2 million is kind of the working capital balance of the highway, but includes a big piece of that for equipment replacement. So earlier, um, I think Mike mentioned that the state has this format for the accounting. Is this a statewide a program used statewide for tracking all of this? Yes, we use a program yep. called CAMS provided by DOT. I think 62 or 68 counties use this program. So there's a few out of the 72 that do not. But Okay, I didn't realize we were using a statewide program and knowing the state they're tracking this quite well then. Yes, okay. they are. All right. it, it's it's yeah, a it, very complicated system. Okay. Yeah, it's been around for well over probably over 30 some years, 40 years maybe. And uh, it it works well and they, they, they spend money on it. They got people dedicated to it and they're always trying to improve it. So uh, it's a it's it's worked out pretty well in my opinion. I think the other thing to point out is all of this data that these counties that are using CHEMS, they report it to the state annually. And the state uses that data amongst other things to set the machinery rates that they're gonna pay Matt, when one of his trucks rolls out on the state highway system, the county uses that rate to build a local town or, or the county also to reimburse for that vehicle. So all those costs are kind of rolled in there statewide. Yeah, and, and, and all the highways complain that they don't increase the rates quick enough for inflated purchase prices. But yep. yes, that's a nev never-ending thing. <laughs> Anything else on the capital budgets? I want to point out one thing. Uh, if you look at, there's a line there saying um, tax levy debt, 1.6 million. That's actually slightly less than last year. We were 1.628 last year. And then so we'll look for a motion to approve this with the addition of a vehicle for the sheriff's department, which would be in the neighborhood of six to 7,000 a year. Yep, and we'll have an exact number for you at the next meeting. Brad, we'll go ahead and make that motion to approve the capital budget. With the inclusion of with the- With the inclusion of the lease vehicle. Is there a second? Ron Stender will second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we will go to do, 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 do. the operating budgets. Um, do you have a summary on this one, too, or do you want to? Uh, no, we don't have a summary for that. Um, if you want to wait, um, we'll have a summary for you at the next meeting. We're still making tweaks inside the system, to be honest. Well, do you want to go through these today or yeah, not? Yeah, we can go through them uh, just so you have an idea. what. Okay, so these are, there might be some tweaks, but. Yeah. Um, so let's go through these and if if we can, we'll just approve them all at once with, with any changes that are proposed if there's. Yeah. Um, I don't know what happened to clerk of courts here. It's the, you're right on it. I know, but I just see the. Um, oh, the rest of it? Right, I don't see the numbers. So I'll just move them to forestry. Uh, no, that's the uh, that's a uh, so let's go to the highway or HHS. So 
Amber did a summary for you because um, I'll be honest, you don't want to see her entire budget. <laughs> it takes up hundreds of pages. Um, so Amber's here to answer any questions. I do have one question on it. Um, I does do your labor numbers assume one hundred percent employment for the entire year? Um, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's if we find we need to cut that one of the things we could do is assume 95% em employment because there's always people coming in and out of HHS. Um, so we're always going to have a vacancy at some point there. I'm it's the same with the sheriff's department. Um, we're assuming 95% because there's always a jailer missing or a deputy missing or, you know, so. Um, so anyhow, Amber's here for questions if you have any. Amber, I got a question on the children and family. For 2024 expenses, you've got three million thirty-six thousand and change, and then on 2025 expenses, you got two point four million. You dropped about six hundred thousand. Yeah. You explain that. The biggest is um, the BFI grant, and that is three hundred and sixty-eight thousand, I believe. It's going off the top of my head. Okay. So, so that's the biggest one. And then the other thing that we had, which increased for 2024, but we didn't have in 2023, was the Ignite grant. And that is ending next year, we anticipate by May. So sometime next spring, the, those funds will run out. So I, I only have like 75,000 in the budget for that. And um, last year we had like two or 300,000 in there for that, uh, let's see. Actually, we had 357000 in there and um, 469000 in expenses for the BFI. Uh, Ignite is the revenue and expense is in and out. So it's the same amount of money. So you'll notice the revenue is also down and also the expense. Um, we have not heard on the BFI grant. So if we do hear on that soon, you know, I can get rerun the numbers and get it back in. Because if we were to get that, that actually would possibly lower our levy request um, because then we could be spreading out our overhead over more programs and employees. So that actually would lower it a little bit because once I took it out, it did increase it slightly. So it'd be a really good thing if we get that grant. <laughs> Besides how much it uh, is um, positive for the school and our um, neighborhood, but so when do you ex do you know when we expect to hear about that? Um, probably any day between now and November. <laughs> no, right. I don't know. I think they were still. Um, last I heard, I think they were still submitting the grant, so we won't hear for a little while yet. All right. So, um, uh, Chairman Kenny and I have been talking about the Spark Grant, and it's not in the budget, but we would consider doing a budget amendment if you got. We do a budget amendment if. Yeah, mm -hmm. it came in. Or if we came in in October, even after publication, we yep. would go ahead and stick it in. Okay. So we just don't want to include something that we don't have. Yeah. No, it's it's best to. So, so yeah, if you find out at the end of November, you get it, or December, then we'll just do a budget amendment. We're probably going to have to do one anyhow for healthcare. So. Sounds good. Any other questions? Just so I'm clear, uh, overmatch means the amount of funds that you are short from the funding, the, from the revenues off the expenses? Yes. So the trends are a little alarming if you're just looking at what you're expecting on overmatch. And I know this isn't a reflection of you at all. Mm -hmm. um, but is anyone else noticing that by the year 2025, our overmatch will be 3.1 million? Next year, it's 2.8. This year, it was 2.2. Yeah, and like, I mean, you could, I kind of made some notes here too on, on this main summary, but so the went up 273,000 um, of, of needing. So when we lost some of, you know, even with the BFI grant, we that's part of our match. Like we get $360,000. The expenses is, um, you know, probably like, Four hundred um, sixty thousand dollars. It's just safer. So then we have money that we pay um, out of our budget for that grant, but we're also a, but that's uh, that's saving money 
from us spending it from other grants. So our revenue didn't increase for any of these other programs. So our, that's gonna stay the same. And I'm having to spread out these expenses to these other programs that don't create any more revenue. So that's why that increased. I um, it, My estimate is like around $60,000. Like if it went up after I added, or after I took out that BFI grant. Um, so that's part of it, but also just in the wage increase and I say wage and fringe um, was about 205,000 for increasing steps. And then also um, there was two more employees that were on family plan uh, anticipated compared to last year's budget. Well, there's $60,000. So, <laughs> so that's just like one person can really kind of swing that too. So that's kind of the main things that really caused that 273,000 is like the wage increase and then just reallocating our, our um, overhead costs. The other thing is some of these costs are just unpredictable too. Yeah. Like we, we don't didn't raise any other we don't know how much any mental health care commitments we're gonna get. We don't know how many child custody cases we're gonna get. We don't know how many anything we're gonna get, really. Yeah. And I did just use um and some of the revenue we hadn't received yet, I used what we used in 2024. Um hopefully it doesn't go down, it will at least get a little bit more. When I first presented this to our board at human services the week after I um, child support, she sent me her revenue that increased 10,000. And then I got found out our week revenue and that went down 4,000. So, so I was able to change our numbers by, you know, requesting at least 6,000 less dollars. So every time, if I find out that we get more, a new revenue source, I can change it and send it to, um, Dan and the consultant so that they, as they're working on the budget, as you know, as you know, we don't find out this stuff till fall. So I do think it's going to change some more. I'm hoping more in the positive and not the negative, but. <laughs> well, and, uh, you know, a lot of it also depends on what the legislature does. Um, you know, they, they could do some more funding uh, programs. Um, it depends on what Congress does. Um, there could be a lot more social sp spending program, depending on what happens in November at both state and federal level governments. So on the library um, budget, so the state requires that we make a contribution based on checkout. So one question I've been asked is with the Vaughn Library renovation, who's going to pay for that? And it's those of us in the city of Ashland. And the renovation um, is, if my understanding is correct, it's based on, uh, this, is, this number is based on checkouts. And the Vaughn apparently is going to move to the old CESA building for the renovation period instead of trying to stay open because the renovation with the stairs, the new stairwell in the northwest corner, and then going from first to second. So now my understanding is they're going to go to the CESA building. I have no idea how that's going to impact checkouts, but my guess is it'll have an impact on the number of checkouts. And then if the checkouts from Ashland County residents outside of the city limits decline during the renovation. This number, if my understanding is correct, will actually be a little smaller during that time frame. Yes, that's correct. So, but we're not, you know, the rest of you outside the city limits don't have to fork out for the renovation. <laughs> hey, it's only $5 million. I, I'm surprised that the, people who have asked me that, including from Bayfield County, because they make a contribution too, because they have patrons that check it out. So, all right, Matt? i just curious, you said on contributions on checkouts, does that include online? I mean, I, I, I use an online service that I use my Vaughn library card. So does that? Yeah, they... it includes all checkouts. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so maybe you should check it out the Washburn library. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on operating budgets? Dick? Yeah, I got a question. Um, a while back, I, I, when I was going through this catalog here, I found uh, what the snowplow budget was for last year. Um, I'm pretty sure that Sherlock Holmes couldn't find it again. What happened to that money that we didn't spend? You probably said it, but I, I don't. I didn't hear it. 
just you mean our snowplow budget because last winter was a, yeah. a easy winter so that includes the whole year we haven't spent all that money yet because it goes until uh december 31st so if winter comes early this fall or there's more expenses oh within the year yes within okay. a year so oh. so i don't i don't have a good number for you of where where that would be at at this time and okay. didn't you didn't you make up some of that revenue by doing brushing and stuff? Yeah. So generally, if we come out of winter, you know, in the spring, that it was a pretty easy winter. We have historical numbers for for the fall or the you know coming into the upcoming winter. So we will spend more money on our county highways doing brushing or patching or some um, you know bigger pavement. I wouldn't say pavement replacement jobs, but maybe we do some rut filling or some crack sealing or something of that nature to offset that also yeah and i think it would it would be good to add to that that the county appropriates money for winter maintenance for you know summer maintenance and for construction that goes into a separate fund on the county's general ledger and if for some reason you know it doesn't snow anymore this year and there's money left it stays in that fund and it's available to be used by the county for a future year for highway services or to apply against a different budget, but it is tracked and kept in a separate fund. Yeah, it allows us to build that fund as we talked earlier, that 1.2 million. We can we can build on that to use that toward bigger projects um, like like we are planning to for next year. We received that grant from Madeline Island County H to do some riprap we'll be using some of our fund balance to, for that project. So Dan, you mentioned there could be some tweaks to the operating budgets between now and October 3rd. Would you like a motion to approve? Um, why don't we just wait? Reason? Why don't we just wait till we get the everything together for you? That way you have something accurate to look at. Okay, so any other questions or comments on any operating budgets to this point? Then on your agenda, Dan, as you scroll down on the left side, um there's m3 health insurance again that's a duplication from earlier i take it oh no we haven't gotten a report yet and so it's a standard item okay it won't come later uh tracy doesn't have her thing ready oh yeah she does it's uh the county investments so next will be the treasury report right so that's this um, and again, she is staying in constant contact with the bank on interest rates. Um, I would expect our interest rates to be going down in the next few months after the Fed meets this month. So, so the county and the bank are going to talk on a regular basis because as rates change, then they're talking and either has to take the initiative and say, hey, we need to talk. You're just going to talk, and that way it maintains a good relationship? Correct. Yeah. I am guessing the bank will be contacting um, Tracy if they're going to lower the rates. So the longer we wait, don't hear from them, the better off we are. Okay. Uh, sales tax. Um, I did not get a PMA report this month for some reason. Uh, so we have the old form where um you know we're still up quite a bit on sales tax overall but you know there is a little bit of weakening going on you know we were last month we were up 18,000 this month we're down 8,000 you know so i think we're still up our in the neighborhood 9% of all year over the year um I don't know. Uh, we'll have to see. I mean, July, the August numbers represent June. Everything's two months behind. So I expect September numbers to be pretty good because July was pretty busy and crowded. Um, everything seemed to die at Labor Day, I guess. So August, I don't know. So that'll be the uh, October numbers. But um, you know, once we have, but we are hitting some other big events too. October has the marathon. So. Administrator updates. Um, well, the building is just about done. Uh, 
there is no more scaffolding. Um, they just have a few minor repairs to make. Um, we will find out what our final equalized value is next week, I believe. I believe it's the 16th or something comes out. We'll also find out next week what our um, shared revenue is going to be. That's one of the, another reason to hold off on the operating budgets. Um, so that's that's good. That and then we can actually finally stick everything into the budget and have a real summary for you. Um, I am moving stuff around in some of the departments. Um, you know, ex example is Tad. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you all know Ann Whiting retired. Um, so we don't have a criminal justice coordinator, but the we can pay for part of that position with the TAG grant. So I'm trying to move stuff around in that grant to free up as much money as possible to lower our levy, limit, levy impact. So um, joint dispatch, um, and Ryan, you can talk too. Um, we're chugging along. Uh, we, we had problems with Lumen not being, uh, Responsive at all, and they have to be, they have to turn over a switch in Rice Lake, and they haven't wanted to do anything. Uh, Senator Baldwin finally called the FCC, and I imagine it's going to be done within the next couple of weeks. So, um, but it was a statewide problem too. Uh, Lumen and and all the other telecoms are dragging their feet with uh, switching over to EziNet which is an AT&T product. So nobody wants to help out their competitors. So it was a statewide project. Project. Um, I don't know if I told you, we got a three, when Congress finally passes a final budget, which will be next year sometime, um, we got a $3.4 million grant for radios for, for our sheriff's department. And it's actually a congressional appropriation, directed appropriation. So we can thank Senator Baldwin for that. She's the one who got it in. Um, Senator Baldwin also got something in that Supervisor Ellison would like to tell you about. Uh, we got a significant grant for airport renovation. Um, our main uh, runway is gonna be redone. Uh, there's a company out of Eau Claire that's gonna start the work next year, um, but it'll be three plus million dollars of outside money coming in to fix up the airport. So um, we are still hoping to um, get joint dispatch up and running this year. But again, it's a technology issue and it's holding us back. Uh, and week and a half is the WCA conference. Um, Mark AA and I have a meeting set up with uh, the head of the local government revenue, with the DOR. Uh, we're going to talk to her about the uh, innovation fund. Um, the way it seems right now is we're going to be locked out of being able to get a, a grant from that fund because we move faster than the DR could write rules. So but if we're going to talk to her about that, see if we can't get it. But if we can get it, um, state will pay 25% of our cost for the first three years. So, um, so, so we do have a meeting set up about that. And if she is not helpful, then that will be our first order of business at uh, the legislative exchange in February. The next meeting is scheduled for, I believe it's a Thursday, October 3rd at 2 p.m. Uh, yeah, that's what we just, yeah. And uh, so everybody knows county board is the 26th at nine. Of September. Yeah. Third. Uh, county board is 26th at nine. Finance is October 3rd at two. So you're proposing to pass a budget October 29th. We need to give notice. So we're looking at October 3rd. October 10th, it has to get to the newspaper. So we're looking at October 3rd is potentially the last finance meeting before publishing the notice for the budget. Yep. And I guess if we have to, we'll hold one more in there. So we're hoping October 3rd is the last meeting before publishing for the budget. So if there's anything, you know, that would be the meeting to get it to Dan, so it's on the agenda. 
And one more motion, Mr. Pufal. Uh, I just a uh, microphone. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Mr. Pufal asked him when the board meeting was. The full county board meets September 26th at 9 o'clock. That is a Thursday. Uh, and the reason for it is the WCA conference is that Monday and Tuesday. So I am going to be gone. Chairman Murtick is going to be gone. Vice Chair Campo will be gone. Motion to adjourn. I can second that. We have a motion by Mr. Pufal and a second by Mr. Elson. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you.